So let me introduce myself first. My name is Grzegorz Bizon and I work at GitLab as a backend engineer. Uh, I have been working for a couple of years on the CI CD solution. Can you hear me well? Is it okay? Okay. This way? That way? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is, is it okay? Yeah, okay, I, I think it's going to be better. Uh, yeah, so I I, <coughs> I work at GitLab as a backend engineer and I had spent a couple of years working on GitLab CI before I decided to move to the serverless team to build something new, to build something useful, perhaps something that will allow people to be more productive. And um, today I'm going to tell you a story about building a serverless platform. We are in the patterns room, so uh, Basically, I will tell you a lot about our approach to building the serverless platform. It's going to be about GitLab serverless platform, but hopefully you will be able to find some patterns, something that you can reuse in building your own uh, tools. But before we uh, proceed with a uh, description of how we are trying to build a serverless platform with Golang, let me tell you a little bit more about what the serverless, serverless actually is. So the name itself is quite confusing. So there are servers. Like the name indicates that there are no servers. We are not going to run your code in a parallel universe where the servers are not necessary to run code. They are there. The point is that you should not really care about servers. And we have a bunch of um, interesting products out there. Like we do have AWS Lambda. We have uh, Google Functions, Google Cloud Functions, Azure Functions. And these are really nice products. Uh, you can achieve a lot of awesome things with that. Uh, and we mostly refer to them as functions, as a service platforms. So it's about functions. But we also know that in the past, or actually it's still there, we had platform as a service. So what's the difference between a platform as a service and a function as a service? Uh, and in my opinion, the ma there are two major differences. The first difference is that functions are supposed to scale up and down. Like it's much more scalable solution than your applications deployed to platform as a service, for example, Heroku and stuff like that. So functions are uh, designed to, way, to run concurrently and scale up and down. So probably run more in parallel than concurrently, but you get the point. Uh, in case of pass platform as a service, uh, this solution is not that scalable. Usually your applications are much bigger than functions. So it's much more difficult for a platform to scale up and down your, uh, your application. And another major difference is that functions are supposed to be stateless. And uh, you might wonder, what does it actually mean for a function to be stateless? It's all about state. We are writing software and it's supposed to produce effects. Side effects are very desirable, and uh, state is all about what software is about, right? So what does it mean that uh, your function should be stateless? So basically, I think it's uh, the, the example uh, could be writing a concurrent function in Golang. You are supposed to manage access to the shared state through mutexes, perhaps using channels. And uh, it's very similar to what we need to do in case of functions running on the serverless platforms. It's very difficult to manage your functions when they need to access some kind of a shared state, modify, for example, database, and other functions also need to access that the database at the same time. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, it's all about the access to the shared state. So it's a principle, it will be much easier for you to write your functions if they are going to be stateless. But like that's a principle, but not a hard requirement. But that, that's something that makes sense. And uh, yeah, we are trying to build something new. And serverless, in my opinion, is all about simplicity. The serverless should be simple. You should not need to access your uh, 
configuration in a way that, for example, you are responsible for scaling up and scaling down your services. You should not deploy your virtual machines whenever you see that the load is kind of high and you would make use of additional resources. So serverless should be simple and uh, yes, servers are still there, but the point is that you should not really care about where it, your code runs, how it runs, how it scales up, how it scales down. Like, of course, you still need to have insight into logs. You need to have insight into function invocations. You still need to know uh, where to check for, uh, you know, all the logs that are out there. So, yeah, it's 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 all about simplicity, uh, but you still need to do, do at least a little amount of ops. Uh, and um, how are we trying to? What what are we trying to achieve? Uh, we want you to write code, perhaps it's some Golang function. We want you to push that code, code somewhere because you probably want to version control it. And then we want to manage the workflow from source to function. So in the end, you push your code and it runs somewhere. So let's take a look at a very simple Hello World example. So this is probably a Golang function that you should be able to write in 10 or 15 seconds. It won't run and work because serverless method is not really defined, but if we defined it, that could be a perfectly correct serverless function that we can deploy somewhere. So let's take a look at something a little bit more complex. That's actually something that works. That's the code that uh, GitLab serverless platform supports right now. Uh, and uh, basically it's a run function that takes HTTP response writer and uh, HTTP request. What makes this function the HTTP handler function, right? It, it will encode some message. Um, and the function is going to modify the, the response writer in a way that whenever you invoke it, it's going to respond with a JSON payload message, hello world. So as I told you, we want to probably um, version control this, this source, so we need to uh, initialize a new Git repository. Uh, the run.go is going to be the file uh, in, in which we are going to write our function. And then we still need some amount of configuration. Hopefully this step is going to be optional in the future, but at the moment you need to write configuration for your serverless platform and additional GitLab CI YAML configuration file. But hopefully it will not be needed in the future. Uh, you of course need to commit your function and push it to GitLab. GitLab I should be able to detect that the project does not exist. It is going to create a project for you if that does not exist. And hopefully one day you will be able to see a response from remote telling you, you what is the URL of your function, that it has been deployed to production testing or staging environment, and um, then you can just copy paste it somewhere and invoke your function. So um, how to write the serverless configuration file? Uh, is there anyone who has ever heard about the serverless framework? Yeah, a, a few people. So the, the, the format of this uh, configuration file is very similar. We are not using serverless framework, but serverless framework is a really awesome software that makes it easier to uh, deploy your serverless functions into uh, many different providers backends. We are not using the serverless framework, but the, the syntax here is very, like pretty much similar. So you need to define where your function is going uh, to be defined, like what, where is that, what's the directory of your function, where, where, the, where the source code can be found. You need to define the function name and the runtime you would like to use. So we could probably auto-detect the runtime, we could see, check that there are a bunch of Golang source files and that uh, it's uh, Golang, so we could probably use Golang runtime. But the point is that you can have like a lot of or multiple Golang runtimes, one runtime that does something and uh, another runtime that does it the same thing in a different way. Or you can actually provide your own runtime. You can write your own runtime that's going to 
wrap around your function, and this way we will be able to invoke your function. So a little more about runtimes. So the runtime defined here, the GitLab runtimes go. That's probably the most simple runtime we could come with in something like 10 mi 30 minutes, one hour. It, it's probably the time that we had to spend implementing this, this runtime. It, it's basically very simple. So it takes your uh, serverless.yaml. What's especially important is the function name. Uh, it's going to transform your function into HTTP handler, something that can be uh, passed to the HTTP server. So we are going to spin up an HTTP server um, and we are going to pass your function as a HTTP handler to the function to the um, to the HTTP server. So whenever someone invokes, uh, like hits the the HTTP server, the function is going to be invoked, and will do something for you. So that's very simple runtime. But what happens here? That's the missing piece of the puzzle. So in that case, we are actually going to use uh, Go plugins. The Go plugin is a very interesting technique to make your code a little bit more dynamic. Uh, so a plugin is um, a shared object library uh, built with Go build, build mode plugin. And um, we can load that shared object during the, fun uh, your, the runtime of your HTTP server, for example. And um, we can invoke functions that are defined there. So the requirement is that Go plugin uh, is a defined is a main package with some functions defined. It should not contain a main function. Uh, we need a C Go to actually compile that, and we can't uh, easily use static linking because like C Go is required. And um, the Go code defined in our runtime that transforms your function into the HTTP handler is just a few lines of code. So we open the shared library. We are checking if there is a function defined there with the function name, uh, the function handler that you have defined in the serverless.yaml. And we are going to transform that into, in this particular case, it's the HTTP handler function, right? So you can write your own runtime that will basically uh, invoke a function with a different signature. You can extend this one to be a little more generic. For example, if you would like to use interfaces, autodetic function sig signature in uh, some way. Um, and yeah, so you know that we have a function. Then we have a runtime. The runtime wraps your function with HTTP server, but how are we actually going to build that? So the workflow from source to function actually includes build and deploy stages. And we are using GitLab CI. The GitLab CI is obvious solution for us, but if you would like to create your own platform, you can use Jenkins, you can use the Tecton pipelines, you can use Circle CI or anything else that can build and deploy your software. Um, a few more words about GitLab uh, CI. Under the hood, we are using GitLab Runner. As you can see, that's also an application written almost entirely in Go. A GitLab Runner is open source project that is used to run your CI CD jobs, and then it's going to send result, results back to GitLab. But what the results are, and how, what, how we are building the runtime, the function, um, and what are we sending back to GitLab? So as you have probably guessed already, uh, we are building containers. Actually, we are building images that are going to be uh, pushed to some kind of a registry. And um, that's actually what uh, the function is going to become after the build and deploy stage. And um, we created the software that's uh, something that actually runs on a GitLab runner. That's the software that we use to build your function um, and your runtime. So we are going to use Kaniko to build your container. So GitLab KITL is going to fetch the runtime that you defined in the serverless.yaml file. It, it's going to 
fetch your function, your source code as well. It's going to build your function as a Go plugin before it actually builds the runtime itself that wraps around your function. Uh, it, and it's going to push your uh, container to the registry. In this case, it's a GitLab registry. It can be anything else. Like GitLab KTL is a tool designed to run GitLab CI, and it's this is CI or uh, application. It what means that uh, it's much easier to use it to push to GitLab registry, but you can provide your own registry, for example, here. So, uh, and we are using Kaniko, and Kaniko is again it's a software written in Go. That's a software that makes it much easier to build your images in the CI environment, because without the CI and uh, without uh, like outside of the CI environment, you can easily build images using Docker engine, for example. In the in the CI environment, um, builds are usually running inside containers, which means that without the Kaniko, you would need to have Docker in Docker in Docker, and it it becomes complex, so um, Kaniko make, makes it much easier to build your containers and images in the CI environment. So GitLab KTL is going to take the runtime serverless.yaml source code and it's going to transform it into container and um, where it's going to run. And that's again something that you have probably guessed already, we are going to deploy the container, the image, to the Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is, again, as you can see, software, open source software written in Go. Uh, and that's uh, container scheduling and management solution. And Golang is a Kubernetes, Kubernetes native language. Kubernetes is an extensible platform, which means that you can write Kubernetes controllers, you can write Kubernetes operators, you can write a lot of software that integrates with Kubernetes. And Kubernetes authors made it much easier to integrate with Kubernetes because they provide a lot of software. Written in Go, for example, uh, API clients, code generators. This code, this software is written in Go and it's much easier to use it if you are using Go. So that's the reason why Golang is a Kubernetes native language. But Kubernetes, Kubernetes is not enough to run complex serverless workloads. We need something more. And there is another interesting project also written entirely in Go um, that is supposed to make running serverless workloads on Kubernetes easier. So it's called Knative, and Knative is scale to zero request-driven compute for running serverless workloads on Kubernetes. It's additional software that runs in the Kubernetes cluster and manages the life cycle of uh, your containers, of your functions. So Knative is able to detect that the traffic is increasing, that you have much m higher amount of invocation, and it's going to um, scale up your function. It's going to provision additional pods in Kubernetes. It's going to spin up more containers so that you, your traffic can be more evenly distributed and, uh, and um, it, you can still uh, serve content, invoke your functions. So how the source to function, or actually source to Knative in our ex example, uh, workflow looks like? So we are going to write code first. Then GitLab is going to transform your function into a Docker image. The Docker image is going to be deployed to the Kubernetes cluster, and Knative will manage the life cycle of your container. As you can see, there are boundaries uh, around Kubernetes, Knative, and uh, function running inside, which means that GitLab not necessarily need to manage that, that cluster. It might be a cluster that you manage. Let's assume that you want to manage your own cluster. You want to deploy Kubernetes to bare metal machines, and um, you want to take ownership over you know, how it's configured and where it runs. You can do that because we GitLab does not really need to create that cluster. Like It can be 
existing cluster running somewhere, uh, something that you manage. So that's pretty much everything about how we deploy stuff at the moment, but the next thing that might, might be interesting for you is how are we actually going to invoke a function. So serverless needs to be simple and secure by default. Making serverless secure uh, would be quite a difficult task because you need to manage your certificates. You need to perhaps purchase them or generate them with Let's Encrypt. You need to make sure that the certificate matches the domain that you are going to use to expose your functions. Um, then you might need to uh, encrypt the traffic between a function invoker and the Knative cluster. So if you would like to um, invoke function directly without having GitLab in the middle. So that's basically a GitLab instance. Uh, it, it's not a GitLab company, it's the GitLab free open source software. Um, everything I'm talking here about is a free open source software. So if you would like to bypass the GitLab and directly invoke your function from the Knative cluster, you would need to uh, take care of the certificates, you would need to use some kube CTL magic with Kubernetes and Knative cluster to configure uh, encrypted traffic, for example. But uh, we want to make it easier. We want to make serverless simple and secure by default. So GitLab is going to provision a domain for you. GitLab is going to um, either use Let's Encrypt to generate certificates, or you can provide your own domain or and upload your own certificates. And uh, the traffic between an invoker, like in this case, it can be a browser, uh, and the browser will be able to recognize the certificates uh, the traffic between the browser or an invoker and GitLab is going to be en encrypted with valid certificates. But then between GitLab and the Knative cluster, we are going to use self-signed certificates and we are going to uh, encrypt the traffic with mutual TLS. Um, yeah, and it means that GitLab needs to become a reverse proxy. And it's again where Golang shines. Uh, because Golang is really nice for all those low-level network plumbing tasks, tasks, and it has reverse proxy type. You can write a reverse proxy in Golang in a matter of, you know, 50 lines of code probably. You need to provide, uh, like, I, I remember other talks uh, mentioning that you can uh, basically create a serverless uh, a, a reverse proxy in Golang in one line but you can also make it a little more complex and more powerful by using the reverse proxy in from the HTTP util and uh, instead of using new single host reverse proxy, uh, you, you can um, make it a little more complex. So you need to define a directory which is a function that is going to transform the request that comes into the uh, uh, proxy into a request that's going to be sent and forwarded to the destination. Um, if you would like to modify the response that comes from the destination, you can uh, you can um, write another function that's going to modify the request. And if you would like to manage certificates, change the way that you encrypt your traffic, you can create your new new transport. So this is basically code that we are going to use to uh, build a reverse proxy for the serverless. So the next step is putting it somewhere. So in our case, we decided to put this software, this code into the GitLab pages. And the GitLab pages is a very simple daemon written in Go. Again, it's going to fetch the information about your domain and the certificates, self-signed certificates from GitLab, and it's going to proxy your service traffic. So normally we use pages to um, serve static content that you have deployed uh, static content that you have generated using, for example, Hugo, static site generator, or middleman, or anything else. So pages are designed to uh, serve static content, but in case of serverless domain being detected, we are going to proxy, reverse proxy the traffic from your cluster to the browser. And uh, yeah, so Go is really awesome. You can build almost entire serverless platform with Go. In, our case, GitLab is actually written in Ruby, but that's a tiny part of the serverless platform we are having. We are using Kubernetes, Knative, GitLab Runner, GitLab KTL, and a lot of Kaneko and a lot of more s stuff, and it's all written in Go. 
And uh, yeah, so what I have told you about so far is something that we either uh, released or something that we plan to release by the end of the year. But the serverless platform we're working on is like experimental. It's still alpha. It's not software that is production ready. We still need to figure it out how to make it simple and secure by default. And we are working on that. And uh, uh, a note about the, our plans for the next year. So we want to spend a little more time working on cloud events. And cloud events is a very nice initiative um, to unify how events in the cloud are described. So for example, your S3 bucket can generate an event whenever something gets uploaded. Uh, GitLab can generate a lot of events. Events can come from Knative itself, from Kubernetes. But publishers describe them differently. And uh, it's a, actually a struggle to consume them. So cloud events is a specification that tries to unify how events are described. And uh, hopefully one day you will be able to trigger a function whenever, let's say, something happens in S3 bracket or in GitLab. So let's, let's take a look at this example. That, that is not something that works right now, but something that perhaps is going to work next year. So we want to make it possible for you to define your rela relationship between an event and uh, your function in a version control system. So perhaps you could def do that in the serverless.yaml, but um, another option is to define the relationship between your event and your function in function annotations. Like this way, the definition of the event is going to live in the same place where the function is going to be defined. So in this particular case, we are describing the serverless event uh, that's going to be triggered whenever someone comments on an issue with uh, issue including some content. And then whenever something like that happens, this function is going to run. And you don't want to care about authentication. You don't want to authenticate and authorize the event because you want to be sure that this runs only in the case when the event has been pre-authorized pre and authenticated. So there is a lot of like additional ops and work. If you would like to, for example, use GitLab webhooks or GitHub web webhooks or uh, webhooks coming from AWS, but this is, again, not something that you should be concerned of. So we want to build a simple serverless platform that's secure by default and makes it possible for you to um, define the relationship between an event and a function in a very efficient way. And uh, that's it. Um, thank you. And are there any questions? Thank you very much. And uh, anyone wants to ask something to Greg? OK, so I think uh, no one? OK, I think uh, we're done. So thank you very much, Greg. <laughs>